It's my opportunity today to uh, talk to Mar uh, Mark Fronemeyer. Mark is the uh, founder of Arcamoto. I think I get it right, uh, no, which is not... uh, w which is an electric vehicle manufacturer out in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, we want to talk about uh, why would a guy who was in the computer gaming industry decide that he was going to want to build an electric vehicle? Um, in some respects, following uh, the, in the footsteps or maybe parallel with uh, that other uh, great uh, software guy, an EV guy, Elon Musk. So welcome to EV World. That's a long intro, Mark, but welcome to EV World. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me uh, on the program. It's, it's, uh, forward to the discussion. It, it, it's great to have you here. Of course, I've been following what you guys have been doing now uh, for quite a long time. Uh, I have been remiss, however, in reaching out to you, and my apologies on that. Uh, no but, time you, but you finally got something that uh, is really looks like it's going to finally uh, go to production, and that's, I think, where we want to pick up the uh, pick up the story then. Absolutely. So you began this journey about uh, eight years ago. Um, yeah. You had sold your company, uh, which was uh, Garage Games, yep. for about <clears throat> excuse me, about fifty million dollars. And so, in some respects, it's kind of like Elon. Elon, you know, sold uh, PayPal and uh, decided to build rockets and electric cars. Yeah, um, you you kind of followed in some uh, on a parallel course, maybe a few years, a little few years after he did. Why? Well, Why? What's the attraction of doing software and then jumping into this this game of hardware manufacturing? You know, uh, it's a good question. Um, Elon certainly did way, way, way better with uh, 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 PayPal um, and uh, uh, his his earlier venture than we we did. We did well with Garage Games. Uh, the, the partners we all. Uh, uh, Took away uh, a reasonable sum from from our efforts, but um, not enough to go after spaceships and cars. Right. Uh, but you know, the back in and this was in the uh, spring of 2007 when we when we exited Garage Games. Um, I had been a bicycle commuter for several years. Okay. Um, you know, I had uh, I've always I've always really enjoyed the experience of driving. Uh, but could just never reconcile that enjoyment with the the awareness of yeah. whether it's you know just the the environmental cost of extracting oil from the ground, the geopolitical ramifications of that. Certainly, uh, torching all that carbon uh, and putting it into the atmosphere has uh, has demonstrable uh, negative effects on the climate. Yeah. So, uh, but there was there was that problem of. You know, for me, it's a cold, rainy night in Eugene, um, and I want to go grab dinner with my folks, and I, I wanted a solution that was going to get me to that dinner in a way that would keep me dry and relatively comfortable and safe, and um, and, and and sort of do that uh, do that mission, um, but without having to carry the the significant footprint of a full size gas powered car. Right. And I, I, I figured, you know, hey, it's 2007. Surely someone has solved this problem and come up with a product that anyone can afford that that solves this type of trip. Because that trip, that you know, going out to dinner with the folks or, or going to work or going to school, that it, that actually is the typical vehicle usage pattern for like 76 percent of of car trips out there today. Right. 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 We have a vehicle. Uh, idea that carries five to seven people 300 miles on a gas powered charge, but we use it to travel on average 33 miles a day by ourselves. Right. Yeah. Limited stuff. Yeah. And so there's, that, there's just a huge disconnect between those worlds. And I thought, well, if there was a, a product that, that sort of solved that problem really well, um, it would also be it, it was light enough that it could use really any battery technology to be uh, useful and affordable. Uh, then that was the product I would like to buy. Right. And I spent just I spent months looking for it, just you know scouring the internet and taking test drives of things like the Zap uh, car and so on, and just <laughs> you know it just wasn't there. Yeah. It wasn't there. Yeah. It's still not there. 
Well, um, well, let me ask you though. You you know, you walked away from game of you know with I'm assuming you know a nice chunk of change. You probably could have afforded a Tesla Roadster. That was a light two two seater. Um, why yeah. knowing that you're six four, however, I can understand why maybe you wouldn't be attracted to the Roadster. So the Roadster was a beautiful, beautiful car. Um, one of my criteria uh, for what I was looking for is I wanted something that if I adopted it, that other people could adopt it too. Okay. So the, the, the rarefied air electric vehicle that's, you, you know, in the hundred thousand plus segment just wasn't, uh, wasn't attractive to me as, uh, as a scalable solution. Right. Um, and you know, Tesla has had a plan from day one that they're going to go from, uh, you know, the, the super high priced sports car to the moderately priced sedan to the, you know, the affordable mass market electric car. Right. Um, but they weren't anywhere close to that mass market spot when, uh, when I got started in 2007. And, and even, even I think what Tesla considers to be an affordable vehicle and what, um, you know, uh, middle class Eugene considers to be an affordable vehicle are still pretty different things as well. Right. I, I'm, I was looking for something that was, you know, going to be really a, a one, two person, um, get around very lightweight, you know, somewhere that, and, and it really wasn't until I, I saw this kit vehicle called the buggy. I don't know if you've ever checked yep, that out. I sure have. Yeah. I've been around a long time. But it was just like, and that was actually invented by a guy named Mark Murphy, 10 miles south of here um, in Cresswell, Oregon. And he was the same guy who designed the gizmo uh, before that. Um, but when I saw that vehicle driving down the road, it was like it just illuminated the gap, the gap between the motorcycle and the car. Yeah. That there's, you know, we've got two real kind of broad archetypes of vehicles on the road. We've got the bicycle, scooter, motorcycle two-wheeler, um, you know, very lightweight, very, very efficient, but can tip over, no protection from elements or other objects, uh, you know, sort of not inherently stable. And then we have full-size cars. Right. 4,000 pounds of steel, powered by internal combustion. And in between them, there's, there's really nothing. Uh, you know, over the last few years, we've seen products like the Can-Am Spider, Polaris Slingshot, uh, start to make inroads into the three wheel vehicle space, but for the you know for the purposes of the of the overall market, it's a rounding error. So uh, what? But but seeing that vehicle on the road was like oh, there's like this entire relatively unexplored landscape of vehicles that you know you, you throw an electric drive in there and you you figure out the right platform dynamics, um, and there's an opportunity for a real. Uh, a real market changing product. Yeah. And that, that was, that was really the genesis of Arkham Auto was one. Um, I had, I had come out of a software company and, and done well. So I was, you know, had that sort of irrational exuberance of, uh, of the, you know, your first time at bat, you, you hit a nice home run. Right. And say, Oh yeah. Starting companies is easy. And you know, this will be whatever will be a piece of cake. Um, obviously that, that hasn't proven out to be the case. Um, <laughs> eight years later, yeah. uh, but uh, the the combination of that and then having uh, you know this this very personal need that it turns out matches the needs of almost every driver out there on a daily basis and nothing in the marketplace that really fits that fits that need well at an affordable price point um, and so that that was the 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 really what what got Arkimoto going is I got, I got a kit vehicle. Uh, we started putting it together. And once, once we actually started putting the, the buggy together, it was like, oh, this is just like a, a you know, a, a Lego set for, for big kids. And if we just change some of the Legos and put them together in a different way, um, we could expand, expand this very super niche product into something that would be uh, useful for a lot, a lot of people. Right. So just, yeah, for people that might not be familiar with the buggy, it was a uh, single seater with, you sort of step through the front of the thing and it was a combination pedal 
uh, and with some electric set assist to yeah, it. Actually, there's no pedaling in the in the buggy. It's just a oh. it's a it's a pure electric vehicle. Okay. Um, but you know, Delta tri or uh, reverse trike format. So you have two wheels in front, one wheel in back, uh, rear wheel drive, one seat, and then it had a tilt up canopy right. that lets you get in and out. Um, but cool looking little, you know, not much not much bigger than a than a city scooter. Right. Uh, but but stable on the ground, really zippy, lots of fun. Uh, and, and so that was, it was really having that kind of as a, as a, as a starting point, as a reference point, that was what made the bridge between software and hardware. Right. Well, uh, let, let me ask you about, I mean, Eugene, of course, I think you're, you're from there or from Oregon originally. I believe your father was, uh, what, one of the, the chancellors of the university or something and uh, was a, uh, attorney general or something like that in, in Oregon. Yeah, he was a uh, uh, in politics uh, my whole life. He, when I, you know, I was born into his first uh, representative campaign. He became Oregon's attorney general, then the president of the University of Oregon. Okay. Uh, so I've I've been in Eugene uh, uh, most of my life. Uh, went to school in Berkeley and then came back afterwards to to do computer games. Okay. Um, so so but. Is, is is Eugene sort of conducive? I mean, you know, there's a lot of guys up in Portland that have been, you know, involved with EV conversions and things like that for a long time. But I don't think of Eugene as being kind of the hotbed for, you know, this kind of technology. Well, you know, the, the gizmo came from Eugene. The buggy came from Eugene. Uh, and Eugene is also was for a long time one of the national hubs of motor coach manufacture. Oh, okay. So, you know, the big, at one point we had, I think, about 5,000 people employed in Lane County uh, building large recreational vehicles. Um, and that whole industry really collapsed right as we were getting going with Arkimoto. So, We've pulled on some some real talent from the RV biz. We've also actually brought on a lot of talent from the statewide uh, EV community. So so we've got a few guys from Portland on the team uh, who've been doing electric vehicles. Our, our lead designer actually uh, was on the design team for uh, what became the Gem. So the, oh, okay. the very first neighborhood electric vehicle right. uh, was one of the first products that he did. Um, and now he's going to come sort of full circle back onto, onto Arkmoto. Okay, so he worked with Dan Sturgis then, I assume. I, I would think so, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, look, so you're on your eighth generation of the original concept. What took you so long? What didn't you like about those earlier iterations that, you know, brought you to this point? Right. Well, you know, and uh, it's it is a good question. The trick has it's been a it's been a real design challenge, right? Getting to a product, you know, first first step is to really identify what are the real requirements of the marketplace, and it's it's a hard question to ask people, you know, what is it exactly that you need in a vehicle without having a reference point to to point to. So our strategy has really been. You know, take a shot. Our our the the yellow prototype number one was our very first kind of you know, dart against the wall, right? And then and then put it in front of people and drive it and say what works, what doesn't work, rinse, repeat, and so on, right? And and that really is the process that we've taken uh, year over year. And what we found actually is that is early on is it was like wow, this thing is going to need to have way more capability uh, than we initially anticipated. Uh, the first vehicle we did was, you know, totally open air, didn't have uh, roll protection, didn't have really weather protection. Um, and then as we started, sort of started adding capabilities to fully comfortable seats for both passengers, um, you know, rollover protection, uh, stable platform for high speed operation, uh, it w that, that as we added capabilities, suddenly the vehicle got too big, too heavy, too expensive mm -hmm. to make a competitive product in and, and hit the price point that we were going after. Right. So we've been from day one, the question is, how do we build a vehicle that checks all the boxes and comes in close to $10,000 as an end purchase price? Um, and, and that has been the trick. And we, we thought we were going to get there with what was really an evolution through generations four, five, six, seven. Right, uh, but by the time we had seven on the road, fully embodied, good to go, 
it was still too heavy, too expensive, didn't go far enough. And it was like, oh gosh, what, you know, what, what do we do now? And that was really where, uh, in that, in that, uh, long dark night of, uh, 2014, uh, where, where generation eight was born. Um, and in one, in one sort of fairly simple control change, um, uh, managed to, to, to really that, that the, the one simple change of controls from, uh, a vehicle that is more automotive style, that is like a, a steering wheel and pedals, right. switched over to handlebar controls, like you would have on a snowmobile or an ATV or a motorcycle. And that one change had this domino effect throughout the rest of the vehicle that shed, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds, like 650 pounds of right. weight. Uh, it, made, it made it short enough now that you can park it nose into the curb so you can park three to a space. It was like that one change really tipped us over from a, a, a super niche category of vehicles. You know, we, we, we kept aiming for a global trans, uh, sustainable transportation solution. We kept landing on midlife crisis mobile. Right. Uh, and, and what we finally got to is something that actually works for, uh, works really for the global marketplace. Right.